Greetings, folks. Rod Machado here. I have a news flash for you. Aerodynamics is a complex subject. Don't believe me? Well, just look around for explanations on how a wing develops lift, and you're lucky to find more than a few folks who share complete agreement on the precise process. For instance, mumble the words Coanda effect in front of a few aerodynamic experts, and you'll know what it's like to yell out, hmm, spotted owl tastes good at a PETA convention. Look for a physicist discussion about how Bernoulli's principle helps explain lift and, well, you'll find so many cautions, caveats, exceptions, and exclusions that it makes an Avis automobile contract look like a Hallmark card. And more peculiar yet are the raised eyebrows so many instructors display when they hear an explanation of lift that, well, it varies from their own understanding of the subject, especially if it's a simplified explanation. And the fact is that lift is a complex subject, and even, even oversimplified explanations offered by those who seek to make the complex comprehensible, I think it deserves a bit more respect than it gets. Take, for example, the equal transit theory, as it's referred to by many aerodynamicists, physicists, and instructors. Now, this concept suggests that two side-by-side -side air parcels separated by the wing and flowing over and under it, respectively, reach the trailing edge at the same time. Well, they don't. In fact, an air parcel traveling over the wing always reaches the trailing edge faster than the one traveling below. And that's why the equal transit theory isn't a theory at all. It's really a simple and easily comprehended introduction to lift. Nevertheless, more than a few well-meaning folks raise their noses at this introductory explanation. And like the great visionary hmm, Nostral Damas, these individuals predict that everyone will be flummoxed when they ask, hmm, how do these two parcels of air know that they are supposed to reach the trailing edge at the same time? Hmm. You see, without realizing it, our aerodynamic mavens have anthropomorphized two parcels of air, giving them human-like consciousness, thus allowing molecules to comprehend questions and, therefore, be stumped by them. Poor molecules. Do we really need to remind them that, well, they don't have a life? Respect for air, please. Well, the equal transit explanation is nothing more than a very basic introduction to aerodynamics, and it's used by quite a few prominent aviation authors. It's a perfectly acceptable ab initio introduction to lift, and at least, at least it's not any stranger than having a few folks pretend that air molecules are tiny little people. Nevertheless, accuracy is important, and an accurate explanation should always follow a less than precise one whenever appropriate and whenever possible. So why bring all this up? I mean, do I want to foment dissension and destabilize society? No, not this time. As I see it, the reason some instructors uh, use oversimplified explanations of lift when introducing the subject to students, well, that's the meth message worth exploring. And as mentioned earlier, the generation of lift by a wing is a highly complex phenomenon that's challenging to explain in lay terms with scientific accuracy. For instance, a complete and thorough explanation of lift requires students to understand conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And this understanding also requires a comprehension of equations and conditions with well, exotic names such as Navier-Stokes, Kuta Joukowsky, and Euler. And generally speaking, if the names are hard to pronounce, the math is hard to understand. If explaining how lift develops was an easy thing to do, we wouldn't have so many flight instructors arguing among themselves about how to explain it. And the debate over whether it's Newton's laws or Bernoulli's principle that's responsible for lift production, well, that would be moot. Since I've admitted to creating mischief in the past, let me create a bit more by explaining how a wing develops lift in the simplest terms possible. Now, clearly this explanation is not going to make everybody happy, but, well, that is not my goal. 
Simplicity over popularity is my goal. Ready? Here's the reason why wings work. The wing develops lift by bending the wind. Period. Class dismissed. Now go home. Okay, I'm glad you stayed. Anytime you force the wind to bend or curve as it flows over or under a wing, you cause a reduction in pressure on its upper surface and a downward deflection of the air below and behind it. Both of these reactions, pressure reduction and deflection, are responsible for generating lift. Yes, you heard that right. It takes two to tango. So let's go on a bender. No, 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 not that kind, and examine the details of how wind bending creates lift. Now, as the wing moves through the air, it forces the air above it to bend to the shape of its upper cambered or curved surface. And this curving or bending effect ultimately results in the air's velocity increasing as it flows up and over the wing. So why does the velocity increase on the wing's upper surface? Well, let's look at an air parcel moving up and over the wing. As the parcel of air contacts the upper leading edge of the wing, the solid surface deflects it vertically by increasing the pressure at the point of contact. By default, this generates slightly lower pressure at the top of the parcel, resulting in its initial upward acceleration. All the while, the wing is sliding in underneath the parcel, resulting in the parcel accelerating along the wing's upper curved surface. Remembering Bernoulli's principle, we know that lower pressure is a consequence of higher velocity air. Therefore, the pressure further decreases along the wing's upper surface as the parcel moves aft. Relatively high pressure air ahead of the wing helps accelerate our parcel aft. Given that air flowing directly over the wing experiences a reduction in pressure, what about the air several hundred feet higher above the wing? Well, air at this height flows relatively straight over the wing and isn't forced to bend. Thus, it isn't accelerated. It's just too far away to be influenced by the wing's shape. Therefore, this air has a relatively higher pressure, and we know that air will tend to move in the direction of the pressure gradient, which is from high pressure to low pressure. And this action explains why the air flowing above the wing is forced to follow the downward and aft sloping portion of the wing's upper curved surface. The air is being pushed downward from behind toward the wing's upper curved surface. And this is a relatively tiny push downward on the wing compared to the very large upward push from below the wing. Therefore, this air has no relevant effect at countering the wing's overall production of lift. The result is that the air flowing up and over the forward and thickest part of the wing continues to round the curve and follow the wing's downward sloping surface. After all, without something forcing the air downward on the top of the wing, common sense suggests that it would round the curve and fly straight backwards. Unfortunately, it doesn't do this. Yes, there are a few other players involved here, such as viscosity, but these are largely irrelevant to the discussion. There is, however, one more reason that lower pressure is found directly above the wing. Are you ready for it? Okay, when you cause moving air to bend or circulate, you generate a pressure gradient within the moving air. Now, to see how this happens, let's look at water rotating in a pan. As we generate a circular flow of water, the surface of the water rises at the edge of the pan. The water's height is a measure of the pressure at the bottom of the pan, indicating that the pressure increases as the radius of rotation increases and decreases as you move toward the center of rotation. Did you get that? You see, the induced rotation or curve of the airstream flowing up and over the wing's upper surface is an additional cause of the lower pressure directly above that surface. So now you have two ways of understanding why there's low pressure above the wing. First, you have air being pushed up and over the wing, which increases its speed and, as a consequence, lowers its pressure. Next, you have airflow circulating over the wing, which creates a pressure gradient, resulting in lower pressure near the center of rotation or near the upper portion of the wing. Now let's take a look at what happens behind and below the wing. 
Bending the wing over the wing not only accelerates the air downward toward the trailing edge of the wing, but it also forces it to flow downward behind the trailing edge. Of course, any air flowing below the wing because of its forward motion is also deflected in a downward direction. Now, Newton, that uh, is Isaac, not Huey, Newton's second and third law speak to the resultant action of the momentum imparted to the airplane caused by downward moving air. And an equal and opposite reaction occurs that produces an upward acting force, and this force is also called lift. So there you have it. Hopefully you now understand that lift can be explained by Newton's laws and Bernoulli's principle. So far, we've only discussed a wing in cruise flight at a relatively low angle of attack. But what happens when the wing, the airplane, slows down? Well, clearly a decrease in airspeed will reduce lift production if the wing's angle of attack doesn't change. Therefore, a reduction in airspeed requires that the wing bend the wind at a larger angle to produce sufficient lift for flight. After all, if you bend the wind, you speed it up relative to unbent wind. Bend it more and you speed it up more. Higher velocity means less pressure and ultimately more lift is generated. You see, the pilot mechanically bends the wind flowing over the wing by increasing its angle of attack with elevator pressure. And now the wing no longer relies mostly on its engineered shape to produce lift as it did in cruise flight. Instead, the wing mechanically forces the air to undergo a much larger curve. And this increases the air velocity on the wing's upper surface, thus reducing its pressure despite the airplane's slower speed. Of course, bending the wind mechanically by using the elevator control works up to a certain point known as the wing's critical angle of attack. Beyond this angle, it's just not possible to bend the wind further without causing the smooth airflow to break away from the top of the wing. And this event is called a stall. Congratulations. From this time forward, when you see two flight instructors engaged in a, well, grudge wrestling match over whether it's Bernoulli or Newton that generates lift, you'll know exactly how to respond. No, I don't mean you jump in and help the bigger guy, unless you want to. Instead, you'll grab one fellow by his cape and the other by the pointy ears on his mask force them to sit down, then patiently explain how both concepts, not just one, are useful in explaining how lift is generated. Now, at this point, I've explained lift without having to directly confront concepts such as conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. From here on, you'll have the perfect foundation for understanding wingtip vortices, induced drag, hmm, circulation theory, and maybe, maybe even Navier Stokes, the gods willing. Finally, we've come all this way without once having to make pretend friends with air molecules. So now I'm off to contemplate how the air molecules above the wing know how to beat the ones below to the trailing edge. <laughs>